The Chaos Dwarves arrive in Warhammer 3, so let's go through, look at all the units, see what they're about, and figure out what their role is in this army of iron and fire. We shall begin with... First up, it's old Mechleg's Astragoth Iron Hand. As we can see, his stats are pretty nutty. He's got a lot of everything. He's pretty fast with those mechy legs. Big weapon strength, armor piercing, fire and magic damage too. So he's not only tough, but he can put out some damage as well. And he's a spellcaster with a mixed lore book. For his spells and abilities and such, he's got the Black Hammer of Hashut, which is just a damage boost for himself, which also inflicts the enemy with flammable, giving them a 20% weakness to fire which is of course helpful as he himself causes fire damage. And then for his magic, he's got a mixture of fire and Hashut, Cascading Fire Cloak, Flaming Sword of Ruin and Flame Storm for the Fire Law, and then Burning Wrath, Ash Storm and Hellhammer from Hashut. And if you want a guide to the lore of Hashut, I'll have that video at the end of this one. But a nice mixture of spells, some damage spells, some debuff spells, some buffing spells. So it should allow Astrogoth to stay pretty versatile with his magic and to use what's needed when it's needed. Now moving on to the passive abilities, I'll assume you know what these basic ones do. Encourage hide immunity to psychology, etc. So the first new thing we see is this ability, Contempt, which is pretty important as it's on all of the dwarf units, the centaur units, and some of the other stronger units, but it's not on the goblins specifically. And it reads, Witnessing other friendly units route will only affect this unit's leadership if they also have the Contempt attribute. So basically, only the stronger units care about the stronger units routing. They don't care about the goblins of any kind. And there's another part to this we'll look at in a minute. He's also got Kindle Flame for the Fire Law, Killing Fire, which is the Law of Hashut, Casting Trigger Spell, which does direct damage to all nearby enemies. And then we have Mechanical Overdrive, which is just a damage boost for Astrogoth, increasing the more kills he gets. And lastly, he has Stone Mantle, which will give him a physical resistance, but reduce his speed the more damage he takes. So again, it's a gradual effect. And then he just has a Missile Resistance and a Fire Resistance. But yeah, overall, a lot going on for Astrogoth. He's quite the beefcake. And beefcakes are plenty in this army, as Drazoth the Ashen is also pretty beefy himself. He's quite tough in melee, not terribly good for the damage output. He's got a bonus versus infantry, but no armor piercing, on foot anyway. He's also a spellcaster with the full lore of Hashut. But if you're using him, you're probably going to have him on his big old mount, Cinderbreath. The stat card here obviously doesn't reflect him on this mount, but basically he gains a massive ton of weapon strength, 565, armor piercing damage, and then some buffs to melee attack and charge bonus, as well as of course that speed and mobility being on a flying mount. So much like Astrogoth, he can do it all. He can damage deal, he's pretty tough, he's got that mobility to get out of trouble if he needs to, he's got the lore of Hashut magic to use there as well, and Cinderbreath has a breath attack much like a dragon. So, you know, old Scheiser. Also, comes with dangly gobbos. Very nice. On to abilities, the Graven Spectre. This is a damage boost for himself, imbues magical attacks as well. That's pretty much all there is to it, so just even more damage output for him. And then, as I mentioned, he has the entire lore of Hashut. Some strong spells in there. You've got a Wind spell, which is pretty damn strong. There's a Spirit Leech type spell. Overall, it's a very damage dealer spell against enemies. Not really any buffs or help for your troops as such. Onto the passive abilities, the usual stuff first of all, that contempt ability as well. The Law of Hashut Killing Fire, that direct damage to nearby enemies whenever you cast one of its spells. And then onto his unique abilities, Dark Renown, plus 8 melee attack for nearby friendly units. Only if they have contempt though, so fuck the gobos basically. Nice to see him with a support ability all the same. And then we have the Hell Shard Amulet, this will give him damage reflection and damage resistance while he's in melee. So anything that attacks him is going to take a little bit of punishment in return. And if all that wasn't enough, why not give him Demon Spire Crucible, which will increase his spell mastery strength up to 20% with each kill made by the unit. So these two legendary lords pretty much have the role of destroy everything so far. Which brings us to our final legendary lord then, Zatan the Black. On foot, he's got some pretty solid stats like the other lords, although lacking in the armor-piercing damage. He does have a shield, though, so maybe a little bit tougher than the others. Naturally, though, you're probably going to put him on a mount where you could have either a Great Taurus, so he'll have armor-piercing damage from that and the ability to fly around, of course. Or you could put him on a Lamassu and give him still the ability to fly around. No armor-piercing damage, though, with a Lamassu, but you do get magical attacks and two bound spells to go with that. So still pretty strong, but maybe not quite as strong as the other two legendary lords. 
For abilities, he's got Sadistic Snare, a two-time use reduction to melee defense and a pin. Only to a single target though, but good for getting a lot of damage on a certain target that may be in a bad situation. Then he's got the Armor of Gazrak, a damage resistance up to 30% increasing as he takes damage. So it's going to make him a little more tanky, but only after he's taken a bit of a pounding, which is kind of weird. And then some usual stuff for passives. Got Expert Charge Defense, so that'll help him survive, make him a bit more tanky. Got Contempt. Then we have Boundless Cruelty, a leadership debuff to nearby enemies, increasing with each enemy in range. So the more surrounded he is, the more leadership he's going to debuff, so throw him into those crowds. Then the Obsidian Axe, this is a damage boost for him when he's in melee, increasing with the more kills he gets. Which is a pretty chunky buff as well, up to 40 extra melee attack and 50% armor piercing damage. And then something a little different with the Chaos Rune Shield. It will make him and nearby allies immune to contact effects, like poison and one might assume fire and frostbite as well. And then some resistances as well, but overall a very strong lord, maybe not quite as strong as the other two, but still he's got his strength that he seems pretty tanky with a lot of his abilities supporting that end. And then we have our first generic lord, the Sorcerer Prophet. There's one of fire, hashut, metal, and death. They're not too bad in melee. They've got decent melee attack and magical attacks. They've got some armor on, so they're not terrible there. But they also have a ranged attack, which is pretty strong. It does fire damage and is armor piercing, but it's kind of like a flare gun and will inflict the target with flammable, that 20% weakness to fire. Then for abilities, he's got the Vial of Hashut a hex that will reduce a target's armor by 40 and give a whopping weakness to fire of 60% for nearly a minute as well. And with all the fire in this army, that can be pretty damn dangerous. And then for spells, you'll of course have whatever lore you chose, fire, death, metal, or hashut. And for the passive abilities, a lot of usual stuff got that contempt because they're a dwarf and they don't care about no gobos. For some more unique abilities though, they've got Infernal Engineer. This is a buff for himself and nearby friendly war machines or artillery, giving him a missile resistance and any nearby war machines a boost to their reload times, basically increasing fire rate. And then he's got the Chalice of Blood and Darkness, which will heal him, but only if an enemy casts a spell near him. A bit weird, but that's how it works. He also has a missile resistance and a fire resistance and can be mounted on either a Great Taurus, a Bale Taurus, the fiery flying bull, or a Lamassu. So you can kind of turn these sorcerers into budget Drazoths by putting them on the Bale Taurus. Very strong, but not cheap. And then finally, we've got the Overseer, our generic melee lord. Again, pretty solid stats all across the board. No armor piercing damage though on foot. He can have a great Taurus or Lamassu mount though, which you will probably do. So that can give him armor piercing or that magical power. Otherwise, pretty much your normal kind of melee lord. Nothing terribly special or different. For abilities, he does have good old Foe Seeker for a little speed boost, then Stand or Die for a good little buff to friendly troops. And to one unique thing he's got going for him, the Black Gem of Nah. This will take away all his melee attack, but will make him invulnerable to damage. Kind of different, kind of interesting. Last 13 seconds, he gets three uses of it. So basically, if he's in a bad situation, this could get him out of it, potentially. Or you could use him to dive right at the start of the battle. Just send him flying over the top of the enemy units. They'll all shoot the crap out of him, but it won't matter because he's invulnerable. Then he can fly down, get to some safety and start attacking stuff while the rest of the army arrives. Could be an interesting ability. Otherwise, usual stuff. Got an expert charge defense. Nice. Now to our hero, starting off with legendary hero, Gorda's Backstabber. He's got some pretty solid stats, a shield there, some decent melee defense, nice weapon strength, although not armor piercing. He can go on a giant wolf, which will increase his speed and charge bonus, but that's it. So for the most part, you want to throw him into lightly armored crowds, but he is kind of tanky as well, especially with his defensive abilities like Slippery, which will give him some melee defense, and this new kind of ability, Crooked Dice. Basically, he rolls a dice and you will get one of these three random effects, either 60 armor, 40 physical resistance, or 40 damage resistance. You'll get one of those for 90 seconds, which is pretty nice. They're all defensive abilities, so they help him survive. Like I say, he can be quite tanky. That's going to help him. Although, he does have this ability, Dagger of Malice, which will increase his base damage by 100%, his melee attack by 40, and add poison. So that can help him do some serious damage at the right moment. Maybe when he's in a crowd of lightly armored enemies or taking on a lightly armored character like a wizard. And then we have this thing called Malign Authority. You remember when I said about Contempt and how it's like all the dwarfs and all the stronger units don't like gobos or don't care about gobos? Well, this is the counterpart to that that the gobos have. They actually gain leadership and get buffed from being nearby those units that have Contempt. So dwarfs and bull centaurs and such. This is designed to show the kind of hierarchy of the Chaos Dwarves where the gobos are kind of at the bottom and the dwarfs are in charge. 
So Gobbo's will care about Gobbo's routing, but nobody else will. He also has this Lucky Git ability, which will give him a little chunk of healing, a burst of life-saving hit points, as it says, when he gets below 25% health. And it says feeling lucky five seconds. It doesn't precisely say what that means, but I guess it means there's a chance of it happening within those five seconds. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But again, potentially adding to his tankiness, so Gorda's a good tanky crowd fighter. Now to a big boy in the Bull Centaur Torok. Strong combat stats with a focus towards the damage, armor piercing and a bonus versus large so he's going to be one of your few anti-large units which kind of dictates his role right there he's going to want to look for those large characters or cavalry or monsters to get after for his abilities he's got a couple of classics foe seeker for the speed boost and heroic killing blow for the melee boost and then he has dark mace an area hex that reduces enemy armor by 30 percent and their vigor as well always nice to have armor reductions that's going to allow him and his allies to do more damage and then for passives, we've got the usual stuff. Does cause fear and has that contempt as well. Then we've got the Talisman of Obsidian. Another fairly cool unique ability it negates all magical weapons within the effect area. And that's constantly around 35 meters. So if any units have magical weapons near him, those magical weapons won't work. Saving any of your units that might have a physical resistance. And then we have Guardian, which is a fairly role-defining ability to have. It protects lords and heroes with a 15% physical resistance. That, of course, going hand-in-hand hand with the ability to take away magical damage. So he'll want to be a bit of a bodyguard, potentially, to lords and heroes, but could also go off and just be an anti-large unit if needed. Now to a ranged hero in the Infernal Castellan. Although he's not too bad in the melee, he's got armor piercing and is anti-large in melee, got fire damage too. His missile attack is pretty strong with 375 armor piercing damage, a nice 180 range, lots of ammo. So a solid choice for sniping down lords and heroes, anything large, flying units and such. But overall pretty versatile with his melee abilities as well, and 120 armor is always going to protect you pretty well. And then for abilities, he's got good old deadly onslaught, a nice damage boost. And then Breath of Hatred, an AoE bound spell, gives all friendly units in the AoE flaming attacks, armor sundering, and melee attack. So basically just a big damage boost, one that could be incredibly powerful with some of the weaknesses to fire that other units can put on. Could be very nasty. For the passive abilities, he's got an expert charge defense, so he won't take any charge bonuses. Does have charge reflection as well, so he'll give a little bit of damage back. Got contempt. Then we've got life bane blade. When he's in melee, he will regenerate. He'll get some health back. Pretty crazy, right? He got everything, this guy. And it's not over yet with dig in. So this is quite interesting. When he stood still for 25 seconds, he will then become entrenched, which will give him that expert charge bonus, which is where that's come from. So if he was moving, he wouldn't have that. But he also gets plus 40% range and 15% missile resistance. So ultimately turning him into a proper sniper, although he does have to stay still. And if he moves, he's got to wait 25 seconds before that stuff will come back again. But still a very nice ability and a very powerful, versatile hero. And finally, 13 minutes in, we reach the last of our heroes before the infantry. It's another wizard in the Demon Smith Sorcerer. So, kind of similar to the Sorcerer Prophet Lord. Not so good in the melee, though. Still got the strong ranged attack. Flare attack gives the weakness to fire. We'll still have the magic casting ability, though. Hashut, fire, metal, or death. So you might want to bring one of these along if you don't have a Sorcerer Lord. But this hero is also going to kind of function like a Tomb King's Necrotect for the War Machines. For abilities, he's got the Spell Wrought Scepter, reduces the cooldown for him so he can use his stuff more often. And then for the Necrotech style ability, Reforge. This will allow him to heal, or fix I guess, the units in the army that have the Hellforged attribute. Now what is the Hellforged attribute? Well basically it's on all the War Machines and the Kadai units. So pretty much anything the Chaos Dwarves have put together, this Demon Smith can heal it. And then we've got a Vortex ability, the Demon Flask of Ashak. This will do some damage, nice bit of armor piercing on that, and has a contact effect reducing enemy melee attack. And then for this one, it's the Law of Death, so got all of those spells. Got the usual passives, immunity to psychology, contempt there as well, because he's a dwarf. Then that Infernal Engineer ability as well that we saw earlier that increases the fire rate of nearby friendly war machines. So again, adding to him being a support hero for the Chaos Dwarf creations. So a pretty good hero to bring if you are going to bring some War Machines, which of course you are. So pretty much just always a good hero to bring if you've got the space. Although maybe only if you've got a melee Lord. Otherwise you might be a bit overkill on magic for the sake of the two heals to Demon War Machines. But finally, we finished characters. Let's move on now to some... First up, it is of course the Goblin Slaves or Laborers if you're easily offended. Naturally, they are absolutely terrible, expendable, meat shield. They've got no armor, no melee attack, no melee defense, no nothing. They're rubbish. 
They do have that malign authority ability though, which means they gain plus eight leadership when nearby units with contempt. So basically you want to keep them near dwarfs so that they can get a little extra leadership and maybe make themselves last a little bit longer. For the most part, they are your usual chaffy unit. Just use them to get in the way, to absorb charges, to take missiles in the face, to protect the stronger units. The usual things goblins are good for. And then we have orc laborers. Pretty much the same deal as the goblin slaves, except these can make themselves a little bit more useful. They do have armor piercing damage and a little bit of melee attack with a charge bonus too, so on their initial hit, they can do a bit of damage. With a lack of armor or leadership though, don't expect them to stick around too long. They also have the malign authority ability like the gobos because they're obviously pretty lowly. So again, they will be inspired and gain plus eight leadership from being near dwarfs or centaurs or any of those other units that do have contempt. So a nice little shaft infantry, some good cheap armor piercing, if nothing else. Now to our first proper gobo unit, the hobgoblin cutthroats. Pretty much your average goblin unit, nothing to write home about. They do have a shield though, so they can soak up some missiles and are good for just softening up the lighter enemies before the big boys arrive. They do have that malign authority, so again, inspired by the dwarfs. They also have an ability called Backstabbers, which will give them plus 30% base weapon damage while their health is above 50%. So they're a little more dangerous for the first 50% of their health. It also gives 30% missile damage, but of course this unit doesn't have any kind of missile attack. So still a bit of a gobbo chaff unit, but with a little bit more of a damage dealing purpose. Next, we have the Hobgoblin Sneaky Gits. Again, pretty much your average gobbo unit. They do have poison though, and a bonus versus infantry, which is pretty nice. No shield, however. They do come with a missile attack with only two ammunition, so it's just kind of like a little early Peltast attack. Got poison on that as well. Their biggest thing though is that they do of course have Stork and Vanguard deployment, and that's really gonna be what their purpose is. Vanguard deploy them to try and get after the enemy backlines. They can be very useful in that way. They also have that malign authority again, and the backstabbers ability where they can benefit from both 30% base damage in melee and the 30% missile damage as well. So your usual sneaky gobbo unit really. And lastly, for Goblin Infantry, we've got the Hobgoblin Archers. Pretty rubbish in the melee, of course, but they've got some pretty nice range on them at 130, and they do have fire arrows, although not terribly strong. Unless, of course, you can get them firing at an enemy that has a weakness to fire, as we saw from lots of the Lords and Heroes earlier, then perhaps they could be a little bit more useful. But they've also got Malign Authority and Backstabbers as well, so some damage to be gained there. So your usual cheap kind of missile unit, although can be a lot more effective if you can get them on something with weakness to fire. Now on to some actual dwarfs then. First off, with the Chaos Dwarf Warriors. Do you know how the Dwarf Warriors work for the normal dwarfs? Well, these are pretty much the same thing. They've got a lot of melee defense. They've got that shield for protection, so they're very much a defensive unit. Not great damage output, though. They're designed for holding a line and trying to stay there as long as possible, but they are the cheapest version of a unit to do that. They also have a charge defense and that contempt ability, so they can inspire the cheap lower league gobos. They also have a regiment of renown, the Blazing Beards of Bajarak. These are pretty much the same thing in having the defensive capabilities, but they also have frenzy, so they can output a little more damage than the normal ones. They also have fire attacks and a blasting charge, which is armor piercing. It's a better blasting charge than the normal dwarf one, so they can do some damage before they reach their enemies. So a nice little unit, going to be especially good again if you can get something with a weakness to fire. And then we have the Chaos Dwarf Warriors with great weapons. And again, you know how normal Dwarf Warriors work with great weapons. These are pretty much the same thing. They're just the armor piercing version. If you want to kill the enemy frontline rather than just hold them back, bring these ones instead. Or if you're facing a faction that has a lot of heavy armor, you might want to bring these ones over the other ones. They have contempt and a fire resistance as well as most of these Dwarf units do. And then we have the Infernal Guard. These are pretty much the tougher version of the Chaos Dwarf Warriors, a holding unit designed to stand there and just survive for as long as possible. Not fantastic damage output, but not bad in their case. Comparable perhaps to normal Dwarf Longbeards, although much better as they are a tier three unit rather than tier two. They've got a charge defense as well as the other two usual abilities. So a very sturdy, strong holding frontline option. And then we've got the Infernal Guard Great Weapons, who, you've guessed it, are pretty much the same as Chaos Dwarf Warriors with Great Weapons, just better at the job. Although these ones can kind of be a little bit of a hybrid, as they do actually have a charge defense as well, and pretty good melee defense. So they can stay as a holding front line, but maybe better against an enemy that has a lot of armor, they could be good for that. Or if you want to just play more aggressively and push the enemy front line, they're good for that too. If you want the biggest, baddest iron bastards though, you'll bring the Infernal Iron Sworn. You can think of these as the equivalent of Iron Breakers from the normal Dwarves. They're just super sturdy, super tanky, lots of melee defense, armor, shield, 
They've got that blasting charge as well with the armor piercing, so they can do a ton of damage before they even reach their enemy, although only two ammunition of course. But outside of that, their damage output is going to be on the slower side, where they'll draw their enemies into a war of attrition, which they will usually win. They also have fire and magical attacks, so they've got that advantage too, and of course a charge defense as well as the other abilities. Very nice, very sturdy, very bastardy. But wait, there's a regiment of renowned version as well, although they're very different. More on the damage dealer side, they don't have a shield, they don't have as much melee defense, they do have a nice bit of melee attack, fire and magic damage there, good weapon strength with a bonus versus infantry, although not armor piercing, so going to be better off targeting the lighter foes, do have a charge defense though, those other traits, however they do have a unique ability, Undying Will, which will give them vigor back constantly, and prevents any of the entities in the unit from dying, but only while they're above 75% of their health. So they're kind of invincible for the first 25% of their health, but after that, the immortals become not so immortal. But a very strong damage dealer infantry, as I say, great for taking out the lighter enemies. Now to our few ranged infantry units, starting with the Chaos Dwarf Blunderbusses. They're actually not too shabby in melee and do have a shield, which not only helps them in melee, but also if they're taking missiles while they're shooting at other missile units, but of course the strength of this unit is their ranged attack. It's a very strong armor piercing missile, only short range though at 90, so they kind of don't really get a lot of time to shoot at things on the front line before they reach your front line and then you can't really shoot them anymore. So they can be good as an anti-large unit in that case. If something is towering over your dwarfs, which let's be honest is pretty much everything, but more so the larger units, they'll be easy pickings for these boys to blast down pretty quickly with that strong missile attack. So monstrous infantry, single entity monsters, lords and heroes on mounts and stuff like that, these boys can blast them down. And there be a regiment of renowned version, the Granite Guard, pretty much the same deal, although better in the melee, they've got armor piercing damage in the melee as well, more melee defense so they can survive a bit better, no shield however. Their missile attack is pretty much the same except it has the suppressed ability which will reduce enemy speed by 30% of whatever they shoot at. So that could be especially good if you catch a monster out and it tries to run away, you can slow it down and thus shoot it a little bit more before it gets away. And they have that dig in ability. You remember the Castellan, he could dig in to increase his range by 40% and get a missile resistance and stuff. Well, they've got that as well. So they can actually increase that 90 range by 40%. So that's pretty chunky, especially with that strong missile attack and the speed reduction. These can be very powerful. And lastly, we've got the Infernal Guard Fire Glaives. They're not too bad in the melee with armor piercing and a bonus versus large from that big old weapon. Their somewhat low melee attack though suggests they should probably really only go after large if they are going to go into melee. Do have fire attacks on that as well and like all of these heavily armored dwarfs they are pretty tough with that big 100 armor. Their missile attack is of course very strong as well, armor piercing missile 145 range, nice bit of fiery ammo as well. But you can think of these like your normal Dwarf Thunderers, the armor-piercing strong missile, except these ones are much more capable in melee and against large stuff. But uh, that's all your Chaos Dwarf infantry, let's move on now, it's time for the- For our first cavalry, it's Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders with spears. They are for the most part the same as the Greenskin Goblin Wolf Riders that we've had for years, just with slightly better stats everywhere. A little more armor, a little more melee attack, melee defense, weapon strength, etc. Their role remains the same though, good for harassing backlines of missile units and artillery. They do have that malign authority as they are a goblin, vanguard deployment of course, and an ability called Cowardly Despoilers, which gives them plus 25% base damage when they attack an enemy unit in the rear or sides. So use these in the same way you would Goblin Wolf Riders, a good harassing cavalry just for messing around with backlines more than anything. Maybe the occasional bit of hammer and anvil, they can apply some leadership penalties, but that's about it. And the same idea with the Hobgoblin Wolf Raider Archers. Pretty much the same unit as Goblin Wolf Rider Archers from the Greenskins, just with better stats. That cowardly despoilers ability that the previous unit had, and they wouldn't be a Chaos Dwarf unit without fire damage, so they've got that on their missile attack too. Could be very dangerous, coupled up with those weaknesses to fire of course. Otherwise, your usual harassing skirmish cav. And our last gobbo cav, Oklakan's Wolf Boys. These are the same as the previous unit, just better. They've got improved stats in melee, they've got a shield as well so they can survive a few missiles. Their ranged attack is the same except it has poison on it as well. They have that cowardly despoilers ability so extra damage when flanking enemies. They also have their own unique ability, the Pelt of Wolfag, which will reduce any routing unit speed by 75%. 
that are within 50 meters of them. So that's going to be pretty powerful if you're trying to kill off any units that you've routed, strong units. You'll be able to slow them down and keep the damage on them and maybe get them done quickly. So that could be pretty handy, but otherwise just your usual skirmish cav like the previous unit. Then we move into some big boys with the Bull Centaur Renders. This first variant is kind of like a melee cavalry. They've got a shield, good melee defense, not a huge charge bonus. So they're somewhat designed to stay in prolonged combat. Although they don't have a lot of armor, so they may be best off being cycle charged anyway. They do have beefy armor piercing weapon strength, so they can do a lot of damage wherever they go. Going to be good for clouting infantry mainly, I think. They do cause fear as well, but otherwise you'll use them like your typical kind of cavalry unit. They are a bit slow though at only 62 speed. Normally a heavy cav is like 66 speed, but still fast enough to get their job done. And then there's the dual axes version. Pretty much the same idea here, except they're a little more damage dealer with a bonus versus infantry. Better melee attack and a bigger charge bonus. Of course though, they don't have a shield, so if you're facing a faction that has a lot of missiles, you may want to bring the shielded version. If not, then this version will be better for taking out infantry. And there's also a regiment of renown of this version, the Hashut's Dark Ravagers. Pretty much the same thing, right? Same deal, better stats, a little bit better at their job. But this one also has a missile attack, which is very strong, 120 armor piercing damage, because, you know, look at the size of the axes that they're going to be throwing. They also have Shield Breaker on that as well, so they reduce the block chance of any units with shields. And if that wasn't enough, they also have the Guardian ability, so if they stay near a character, a Lord or Hero, it'll give them a 15% physical resistance. They have an ability called Revel in Fear, which will increase their charge bonus by up to 40%, their melee attack by up to 40 and their leadership by up to 16, the effect increasing with the more wavering units nearby. And they also have a 20% physical resistance, so needless to say, they are pretty damn beefy and capable of a lot of damage. And then there's the Bull Centaur Renders with great weapons. These are pretty much the same as the other ones, but they are anti-large. So these are the ones you'll send after the cavalry and monsters. And they're going to be one of your prime anti-large units because there aren't a ton of them in this army other than missiles. So these will likely be a staple of any army. Now let's get to some real big boys. The Great Taurus is our first big boy, capable of lots of damage output, big weapon strength, armor piercing, fire damage on there as well, good melee attack, huge charge bonus, although lacking in the armor and melee defense, so he's a little more squishy than you might think. For this reason and the fact that he's got a huge charge bonus, try to keep him charging around as much as possible. Don't leave him in prolonged combat too long because he'll get surrounded and that won't be good for him. That being said though, he does have an ability called Blazing Body which will give him an up to 10% physical resistance and give damage reflection up to 25 the longer he's in prolonged combat. So up to you which way you want to play him. Personally, I think keeping him moving and not letting him take too much damage will allow him to do ultimately more damage in the long run. Maybe if it was a 20% physical resistance that you could gain, it would be a bit more worthwhile, but there we go. Oh, he also causes fear and terror as well. So good to keep him flying around and trying to terrorize weak units. That's another reason to keep him moving, but you could maybe do a bit of both. Up to you. And then there's the Bale Taurus. Pretty much the same thing here, just much stronger and better at the job. Has a little more armor and melee defense, so a little more survivable in prolonged combat. Has more weapon strength there. Has the same abilities, got that blazing body, fear and terror, but also has its own breath attack. Much like a dragon, so lots of damage output to be had with that as well. Otherwise, a very strong mobile melee beast. And then we have another flying beast, although this one a little bit more focused on the magic, the Lamassu. No crazy combat stats or anything, doesn't have armor piercing, doesn't have a ton of armor, does have magical attacks on its melee though, and it comes with two bound spells from the Law of Shadows, Enfeebling Foe and The Withering. So two debuffs to enemies which makes it kind of a support unit more than anything, it might be good for harassing backlines and less dangerous units. It also has a passive ability called Sorcerous Miasma, which will negate magical weapons, much like that ability earlier, so it pretty much just takes away the ability of magical weapons, although it's only got a 20 meter range which isn't very far and it doesn't have a physical resistance itself, so you really have to be right on top of whatever you're trying to protect from magical weapons. With any luck, maybe that'll get increased and make it a little more useful. It has fear and terror as well, so it might be good to try and utilize that with this as it really shouldn't be in melee combat too much, but a nice little beastie all the same. And then we have our first and last monstrous infantry, the Kadai Fireborn. Pretty good combat stats, although maybe could use a little more melee attack, perhaps charging them round more to get that charge bonus would be helpful. They've got nice armor piercing damage though, bonus versus infantry, so they're obviously supposed to try and destroy infantry. 
To the abilities, there's quite a lot going on. They've got a 10% physical resistance. They cause fear as well. They are one of the Hellforged units, so they can be healed by that Demon Smith. They also have that Blazing Body ability, so they'll get extra physical resistance and melee damage reflection, increasing the longer they're in prolonged combat. They also function kind of like a demon in that they have demonic instability and can be banished eventually, but they do have an ability called Burning Bright, which makes them unbreakable for the first 50% of their health. And as you can see, that's pretty important for them because they only have 50 leadership otherwise. So the Fireborn, very dangerous, very strong, but only maybe for the first 50% of their health. And then you've got the biggest boy, the Kadai Destroyer. This thing, obviously an absolute melee behemoth, a massive 680 armor-piercing weapon strength, fire and magical damage, lots of armor, lots of health, not a great deal of melee defense, but I mean, look at it. The way some of its attack animations work, it's clearly designed to be an absolute destroyer of infantry with explosions going on. For abilities, it's pretty much the same deal as the Fireborn. As a bound fire demon, they have the physical resistance, the fire resistance, the fear and terror, and are unbreakable for the first 50% of their health. Of course, though, being Hellforged as well, they can be healed by the Demon Smith, which might be quite necessary if you want to keep the unit above 50% health. But still, very strong, very dangerous. Just charge it into crowds of infantry and it will absolutely go to town. Let's finish this up then with the heavy metal you came to see. First off, the Magma Cannon. It's a long range artillery, 450 range to be precise, big weapon strength, although not armor piercing, but it is explosive and fiery. Comes with the burnt trait, so that'll reduce enemy leadership by eight on contact. So it'll launch a projectile, hit the enemy, explode, do some damage, and then there'll be some fire on the ground there as well, which will keep doing damage for a little bit to anything stood in it. It's also Hellforged, so it can be fixed up by the Demon Smith. It has Contempt and a Fire Resistance, like everything else in this army. And in custom battles, there is the option to toggle on an extra ability for this and the other war machines called Hellbound, which basically binds a demon to the machine, thus giving it magical attacks, a 20% physical resistance, and perfect vigor. So just a way to make any of these war machines stronger, I guess. And then we've got the pain train capable of giving even Choo Choo Charles nightmares, the Iron Demon. It's heavily armored, it's unbreakable, it's reasonably quick at 60 speed, comparatively to the 48 speed steam tank anyway. Nice armor piercing weapon strength, anti-infantry, also got that long ranged missile attack of course, big armor piercing damage on that, and the suppressed ability to reduce enemy speed by 30%. So this thing is kind of like a chariot that wants to charge around, mow things down as much as possible, but also make good use of that ranged attack where it can. It has the usual abilities, fire resistance, contempt, fear and terror, is hellforged so can be healed up, can fire whilst moving, and it has its own ability called more power, which increases acceleration 200%, Mass by 50%, speed by 25%, last 28 seconds, 90 second cooldown, thus making this thing hit like a double decker tank. So ultimately it's half artillery, half chariot, use it for both of those ends, it'll work very nice. And then there's also the Regiment of Renown version, the Demon's Tongue, which is pretty much the same thing in melee, but in range it's got a flamethrower instead, so much shorter range but much more powerful attack. Good for melting just about anything. So overall the same as the normal Iron Demon, just a little bit more close quarters focused. And now it slices, it dices, it'll chop up your knob blahs. It's the Skullcracker. This thing is pretty much the Iron Demon without the ranged attack. Use it like a chariot, charge around, mow down infantry to your heart's content. Don't leave it in prolonged combat too long, it's only got 20 melee defense. Abilities wise, yada yada, same as the Iron Demon pretty much, got all the same stuff, got that more power ability so you can get some beefy charges, it's Hellforged. Also with that fear and terror, these units are going to be pretty dangerous in the late game. When enemy units are low on leadership and easily routable by fear and terror, this thing with its unbreakableness will have no problem still charging around trying to route things off, as with the Iron Demon as well. So a very nice chariot style war machine. And then to another dedicated artillery, the Death Shrieker Rocket Launcher. It's terrible in melee, as artillery should be, but it has very nice range at 420 and two different types of attack. You know how an Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower works for the High Elves, where you can switch it between a kind of anti-infantry attack or anti-large attack? Well, that's what you can do with this thing. It has the Death Shrieker Rocket, which will make it function kind of like a Hellstorm rocket battery, ultimately, from the Empire. Or you can change it to a demolition rocket which will give it a bonus versus large and more missile strength and is designed to be used against a single target. 
And when I say single target, I mean literally single target. So while it looks like a rocket, if you fire it into an infantry unit, it'll hit literally one man and put all the damage into him and he will most likely die. But it might seem a bit weird as why didn't this rocket explode and hurt loads of people because it just goes into a single target. But either way, a very strong versatile artillery piece with the capability of being anti-infantry or anti-large. And our final unit in this roster, the Dread Quake Mortar. Obviously it functions like your typical mortar artillery, terrible in the melee but a nice big 380 range, decent missile strength which is armor piercing and has a contact effect which reduces speed and charge speed by 60%. But what's not shown on the unit card here seemingly is the after effect of the mortar round. Once it lands and explodes it'll do damage but then it'll leave this kind of quaking effect going on on the ground for a little while and anything still stood in it will be taking damage from it. So this thing far more potentially damaging than the unit card might suggest, but it's a very strong explosive artillery piece. Other than that, the usual abilities, Hellforged, Contempt, and that optional Hellbound ability. I should also mention that there's trains you can bring, Iron Demons and Skullcrackers pulling Dreadquake Mortars for ultimate destruction and murder. As you can imagine, these are doing damage all over the place in all kinds of ways. Very nice. Also in this roster is the two Hell Cannons, the regular Hell Cannon and the Regiment of Renowned Soul of Damnation. Both of these are in the Chaos Dwarfs roster. If you want to see the stats of them, go and look in your own damn game. So there we go, the Chaos Dwarfs roster. This is part one of the Army Guide. There will be a part two. That'll be posted at the end of this video when it's ready. Otherwise, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Thank you to all the patrons who support this channel. Thank you for allowing me to keep doing this. And well, thank you if you've made it this far into the video. It's a long video, the longest I've done in a while, 36 minutes. Hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the future. Bye.